we're so thankful for all the things that you do for us. Lord, we're so thankful that we're redeemed, forgiven, adopted into the family of God. Lord, we're so thankful for that. Lord, I just pray that through love we would be willing to give uh, just a small portion of what you have so richly given us, Lord, such that the gospel could go forward. In Jesus' most wonderful and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
284 that continue to sing this morning, 284 in the hymn books, some golden daybreak. We'll stand together, sing all three verses. The junior church will be dismissed on the second. 284.
man. Take your Bibles to Second Peter, if you will, please. Second Peter. Really enjoyed that offertory, Hannah. Thank you. It's always a sad time for me when the college kids have to go back. I, I don't look forward to that. I enjoy having them here. And uh, we've had a good time in our Sunday school class. And uh, it's always sad, to, uh, in a way, to see them go. Other way, I'm excited for them. And, uh, but we miss them. I also have a note here that uh, our brother Gino was admitted to the hospital on Friday uh, with his white count very low. And uh, they've stopped the treatment for now, and he's on uh, round-the-clock antibiotics. So uh, let's pray especially for Gino. In fact, let's pray right now. Thank you, Lord, that you love us and that we can come to you any time you've invited us to come to your throne of grace how thankful we are that it is a throne of grace and father that there's grace and there's mercy and there's help for us in our time of need and father we come on behalf of our brother gino and think of lisa as well but father we ask you to touch gino and uh, we pray lord if it please you to uh, restore the count and to restore his health and to strengthen him and to lift him, to encourage his heart, to comfort Lisa and encourage her. And Father, we ask that in a special way you would pour out your blessing, your favor, your grace, your comfort, your peace upon them, and we'll thank you for that. Lord, we do ask for your blessing upon our service this morning. We pray, Lord, as we preach your word, you'd help us. And Father, that would be true in each word spoken, true to your truth. And Father, we'll thank you. Speak to each heart and have thine own way. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Peter chapter 2. Maybe you have, as I have, have heard people from time to time use as an excuse for not coming to church or maybe for staying away from Christianity altogether that there are hypocrites and there are counterfeits. Well, let me ask you something. Why do people make counterfeit money? It's because money is worth something. The real thing is worth something. Do you know why there are counterfeit or hypocritical Christians? Because Christianity is worth something. Christianity, true Christianity, is worth something. Now if you were walking down the street and you saw a hundred dollar bill laying there, after you stopped shouting and you picked it up and you thought, I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to put this in the savings account. And now none of us would do that, but bear with me. <laughs> and we go to the bank and, and we tell the uh, teller there, I want to put this in my savings account. And she takes that $100 bill and begins to examine it holds it up to the light, takes that little marker, marks it. And she says, I hate to tell you, sir, but uh, this $100 bill is a counterfeit. Now here's what you'd do, right? You'd say, all right, then since there are counterfeit bills out there, here's what I want you to do. I'm taking all of my money out of the bank, and I'm going to take it and burn it and get rid of all of it. I'm done with money. Huh? Huh? That's how fallacious the argument is. I'm not going to church because there's hypocrites or they're counterfeits. Well, then stop using money. Folks, don't we realize that it's the counterfeits that really 
reveal the validity, the virtue, the value, the worthwhileness of that which is being counterfeited, of that which is real. Now listen, some doctors are quacks. But when you get sick, you don't stop going to the doctor, do you? Some lawyers are shysters. But when you need legal advice, you go to a lawyer. And some Christians are counterfeits. But you don't throw away Christianity. Some money is counterfeit, but you don't get rid of all your money and say, I'm done with money. No, you don't throw out that which is good and real because there are counterfeits. Of course there are counterfeits. But that just proves the validity, the value, the worthwhileness of that which is real. Now that's what Peter is dealing with here in 2 Peter. He's dealing with counterfeits. And dealing with that which is real in opposition to that which is false or fake or phony. He's dealing with counterfeits. I mean, look at the first verse, and we've already covered verse 1. But look at the first verse. Here's, here's the way he begins the chapter. But there were false, pseudo, there were false prophets also among the people. And by the way, he begins all of this discussion in chapter 1, uh, challenging us to examine our own hearts and in lives in verse 10 of chapter 1 and to give diligence to make sure our election and our calling are sure. Make sure we're not fake. We're not phony. But that we truly are born again and we're walking according to the word of God. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Then we roll over into chapter 2 and we looked at this last Sunday morning. He tells us how to recognize a counterfeit. How to recognize a false prophet or how to recognize a false teacher. And now we move to the middle of chapter 2. He's going to expose their character. And he's going to show us the character of a counterfeit. Here it is. Here's, here's uh, the marks, the character of a counterfeit. Now let me remind you before I get into this. We're not just talking about people who have a different idea than we do. Uh, these are people who use feigned words, as we studied last week. That is plastic words. They say what the people want them to say, and they make merchandise, Peter says, of the gospel, of the word of God, and of the people. They make merchandise of them. And Peter says, listen, this has been going on since the beginning. It began in the Garden of Eden. It's, it's here today. It'll be in the church age. Remember, we, we studied that. And it will exist till the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And that's why he's writing this, because you and I cannot afford to be ignorant of the deceptive devices and practices and the dangerous and damnable doctrines of counterfeits, of false teachers and false prophets. And so he gives us three distinct marks of a counterfeit. Number one, they're presumptuous. You'll see that word right in the text here. It means they're arrogant. They're bold and brash and brazen. There's no shame. They, they teach that lie with a straight face. They lead people in the wrong direction without shame. They're, they're bold and arrogant and brash and brazen. They are presumptuous in their pretense, in their deception. They're bold about all of it. 
And look, look at verse 9. This is where we stopped last week. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation and to restore the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And Peter, he's talking about these counterfeits and false prophets and false teachers. And he says right here, now, now breathe, a true believer, take a deep breath. Remember, God's going to take care of you. God knows how to deliver you. Yes, we're living in perilous times. Yes, we're living in dangerous days. But I want you to remember, God will take care of you. He knows how to deliver you. He knows how to pour out His grace upon you and cause you to stand when many others are falling. And He knows how to judge the counterfeits. Verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous, there's our word. They're presumptuous in their pretense. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. When you put verses 9 and 10 together, what he's saying is this. God knows who is real. God knows who is not. He knows the authentic. He knows the genuine. He knows the fake. He knows the counterfeit. He will deliver those who are real. He will judge severely those who are not. Those who are the counterfeits, the religious phonies. Oh, but they're so presumptuous. Bold and arrogant and brazen and brash in their deception, in their pretense. Prideful presumption. Now, where does all this prideful presumption come from? Let's talk about the root of it. The root of it. Notice it's their flesh. Their flesh in verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh. They walk after the lust. Of their own sinful flesh. That old Adamic nature. We call it the Adamic nature. Because it comes from Adam. Passed down to his sons. To their sons. All the way down to our fathers. And to us. It's the old Adamic nature. The old sin nature. And that old flesh. That old sin nature. Has an insatiable appetite. For sin and for wrong and for corruption and for wickedness. An insatiable appetite. It's never satisfied. That's the root of this prideful presumption. It's the rotten flesh that craves sin. What about the result of their prideful presumption? Well, their lives are filthy and unclean. That's the result. We see it. Very clearly here. I mean, they just, they despise any boundaries being placed upon them. They just want to do what they want to do and live how they want to live. They want no boundaries. In fact, it says here, they despise government. They don't want any entity that, that attempts to put a boundary on them. Curb their appetite. No, they despise government. Presumptuous are they. Notice their, their self-will. That means they're full of self. It's all about self-aggrandizement. The promotion of self. Me, my, I. It's all about being controlled by self. I want to do what I want to do. Ruled by self-interest. Own their own ideas. They want to do their own Thing. They're full of rebellion, full of anarchy, despising any authority, lifted up in pride, just like their father the devil. That's the result. Their lives are unclean and filthy. Then the revelation of their prideful presumption. presumption notice the end of verse 10. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Here's the revelation of their prideful presumption. They're not afraid to speak evil. That is the Greek word blasphemeo, which we get our English word blaspheme from. 
They're not afraid to blaspheme dignities. Dignities is the Greek word doxo, D-O-X-O, from which we get our English word doxology, that which is worthy of honor and glory. They just speak evil, they blaspheme that which because of the God-given rank that thing or that person has, that that should be respected, they blaspheme it. That's what he's saying here. Dignities, those who because of their God-given rank should be respected, they blaspheme. They're arrogant, presumptuous, brash, and brazen, and blasphemous. Nothing is too sacred for them. They make no distinction between secular and sacred. And nothing is too sacred. And they don't mind shooting off at the lip about anyone, anything. No wonder it says in the middle of verse 12, they speak evil of things that they understand not. They're not serious about serious things. They're not sober about the things of God and sober and serious about spiritual things. And therefore they speak foolishly and they speak carelessly. They're proudfully presumptuous. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. But cults and false religions and modernists, and I'm sad to say many new evangelicals, do not handle the word properly. They handle it carelessly. And the interpretation of it carelessly and erroneously. And they speak evil of things that they understand not. False teachers, apostates, counterfeits. They are presumptuous in their pretense. They're arrogant and brash and bold in their deception. Number two, they're beastly in their behavior. They're beastly in their behavior. Notice verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now man was created in the image of God. To know God, to love God, to serve God, but, the, but men have so denigrated themselves that they have begun to behave like wild animals, brute beasts. That's what he's saying here. What does a brute beast live for? Self-gratification. It lives for itself. Self-preservation. Brute beasts are beasts that prey on others. And that's what the false prophet is like, a brute beast. Beast, praying and feeding on anyone that he can take advantage of. This false teacher, this false prophet, this cult, this false religion, the modernists, many new evangelicals. See folks, there's supposed to be a difference between man and animals. They were created differently. And there is a difference. But what he's saying here is man has denigrated himself to act like an animal that just lives for itself and preys on others. An animal does not have a spirit, which means he cannot know God. That animal cannot know God. It cannot pray to God. It cannot fellowship with God. It cannot love God. It cannot be saved. It cannot walk with God. There are things that it does not know and it cannot know and it, and it does not understand. Man was created different. Man was created in the image of God and God breathed into his nostrils 
the breath of life, and man became a living soul with an eternal spirit. And it is the spirit that can know God. And that's what separates us from animals. It is the spirit when ignited and illumined by the Holy Spirit that causes us to be able to know God. But here, these false prophets, these false teachers, these counterfeits who reject the truth, they are like brute beasts, boorish animals in their beastly ignorance. They don't know God. And they don't understand God. And they don't love God. And they don't follow God and walk with God and worship God. In their beastly ignorance. Look at it there in verse 12. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that what? They understand not their beastly ignorance. And shall be utterly and shall utterly perish in their own Corruption. In other words, they're talking about spiritual things and they don't have the foggiest notion what they're talking about. And the, and the shame of it all and the danger of it all is they're talking about these things that they have no idea that what they're talking about. They don't understand. And they're convincing others that they do understand and they're bringing their understanding to others and causing others to follow down that path. They don't know God. They don't understand God. They don't understand God's word. They're committing moral and spiritual suicide. And they're leading others to do the same. That's what Peter is warning us about. He's saying, listen, they're like the brute beasts. They don't know God. Their spirit. The spirit is the organ of spiritual knowledge. And their spirit has not been ignited, quickened, ignited, brought to life, illumined by the Holy Spirit. And so they understand not. That's what he's saying here. They're spiritually ignorant. They're blind. They're dead. They're lost. That's what he's saying. And they're leading others through that wide gate. And down the broad path, the broad way that leads to eternal damnation and destruction. That's your cults, including Catholicism. That's your cults, your false teachers. They're spiritually dead because their spirit, which is the seat of spiritual knowledge, has not been ignited and illumined by the spirit of God. We understand that God is a spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And thus what their spirit quickened not, Peter says, they understand not. Their beastly ignorance. But I want you to see their beastly immorality. Not only their beastly ignorance, but their beastly immorality Peter's showing us the character of a counterfeit. Their beastly ignorance, their beastly immorality, verse 13, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Now here's folks that can't even wait to tonight to do their evil bidding. I mean, they're just out of control. They're just wicked. Spots. You know what the word spots mean? means there? Dirt and filth. Dirt and filth. Spots they are and blemishes. You know what that word blemishes means? Scabs. Scabs. By the way, Peter, I'm not sure he was concerned about being politically correct. I'm not sure. Because you know what he's saying, don't you? He's saying, you know what these false teachers are? They are a bunch of putrefying sores and oozing scabs. That's what he's saying. Now how would you like to sit down and feast with somebody covered with putrefying sores and oozing scabs? 
And yet I want to tell you it's happening all over our country right now. Right now. Because people are listening this morning to false teachers. And that's what Peter's talking about. They're sitting down dining with a man who is full of putrefying sores and oozing rotten scabs. False teachers, counterfeits. Notice their beastly immorality, verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. And heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. By the way, this is a principle I shared with you last week. And here it is very clearly again. Immorality and apostasy are Siamese twins. Mark it down. Adultery and hypocrisy and immorality and false religion and cults and false prophets and teachers, they go together like biscuits and gravy. Amen? Amen. Like biscuits and gravy, bacon and eggs. And that's what he's telling us right here. He says, having eyes full of adultery. What's that mean, eyes full of adultery? Well, they're looking to be unfaithful. They're looking and lusting for an opportunity to be unfaithful. I'm telling you that apostasy and immorality are Siamese twins. They go together. And notice what he says, that cannot cease from sin. They live in sin, but they're never satisfied. That lust just keeps on burning. That's what he's saying here. They're perverted. And they live a life of debauchery, a counterfeit. Counterfeit. Their beastly ignorance, their beastly immorality, and this is the sad part, their beastly influence. Their beastly influence. Middle of verse 14, beguiling unstable souls. That's sad, isn't it? That word beguiling is very interesting. It was a fisherman's term. Peter was a fisherman. So we're not surprised. But the word beguiling spoke of a lure. You know what a lure is to draw that fish in and then what do you do? You hook him. You get him on the hook. And that's what Peter is saying right here. But instead of, of catching fish, these counterfeits are catching men and women and boys and girls. And they know just how to bait the hook. They know just the right terminology and lingo. They know just how to Make that lure look so attractive and inviting. And they come in and they're hooked. They're hooked. Folks, but this is why I'm preaching through this book. <laughs> because I'm concerned as I look around and, and see what's going on. And yeah, hey, I'll be honest with you now. I'll I, I tell you the truth. I'd rather be preaching something else. I really would. <laughs> I'd just rather be preaching something else. This doesn't make for hopping over pews and jumping and shouting. But it's never been more important and more imperative that we understand this. Because we are living in perilous times of cronies and crooks, of corruption, of confusion, of compromise, of counterfeits. And we need to have our souls stabilized by and in and through the truth. You see the word unstable there? Unstable souls? Listen to me. You have got to know what you believe and why you believe it. And then you will readily recognize something that's not real. Something that is counterfeit. Something that's not Right. Because, listen, 
It's not only the unsaved who are being beguiled, lured in, and deceived. Folks, it's happening to Christians. Christians are being deceived and they're, they're leaving the fundamentals of the faith and they're beginning to follow man-made systems of theology. People I know. People you know. There's so many hooks. And they know just how to bait those hooks. They know how to beguile the unstable souls. That is why it is my job. It is my ministry. It is my duty. It is my heart. It is my burden. That we be stabilized in the truth. That we know what we believe and why we believe it. And we're not moved away from this book. And the straight teaching of the word of God. They're presumptuous in their pretense. They're beastly in their behavior. Lastly, they're godless in their greed. They're godless in their greed. Look at the end of verse 14. A heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Covetous practices. Exercised with covetous practices. You know that word exercise is the English word that we get our word gymnasium from? They're trained in the art of deception. They're exercised. They're trained in how to separate you from the truth. And separate you from your money as well. And that's why it says exercised with covetous practices. I mean, they have this insatiable, godless greed about them, Peter says here. So much so that he identifies them here as cursed children. Did you see that? Cursed children. Folks, there's no way to sugarcoat that. That means they are on their way to hell. They're cursed children. That's exactly what that means right there. They don't know God. They're trying to lead others astray. And they're on their way to hell and they want others to join them there. That's what it means. Which, verse 15, godless in their greed, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who, notice, loved the wages of unrighteousness. Oh, a heart exercised with covetous practices loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked, verse 16, for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Now he's given us an example so we can understand this here. These, these counterfeits exercised with with covetous practices who love the wages of unrighteousness. Folks, don't you know there's wages from this? That's why he's using terminology like these men make merchandise of the people. They're making money. They're gaining from this. And they're, they have a godless greed about them and they don't care who goes to hell as a result of it. And so he gives us an example. Here's a man named Balaam in the Old Testament is supposed to be a prophet of God. And here are the enemies of God, the Moabites. Their king is named Balak. And Balak comes to Balaam, who is supposed to be a prophet of God. And Balak, the king of the enemy, says to Balaam, I want you to curse the people of God, because they were about to go into battle. I want you to curse them so that we can defeat them. And he said, I will make you filthy rich. I'll make you filthy rich. I mean, I will line your coffers. You'll have position and power and preeminence. And you'll have all the money you need. Balaam hesitates 
He knows it's wrong. He hesitates. So then Balak ups the ante again. So Balaam decides he's going to try this. Why would he do that? Well, I'm telling you. That's why he would do it. He wanted the wages. He wanted the wages. He wanted the money. He had a godless greed about him. He knew it wasn't right. But he saw an, an opportunity to take advantage of the people and to gain from it. So he attempted to do this and God said, oh no. No way. No way. I've got to make a long story short here because I could go into a lot of details about all of what happened. Let me just make a long story short. God did not allow Balaam to curse the children of Israel. So do you know what Balaam did? He went back to Balak and he said, God won't allow me to do this, but I've got a plan. I've got a plan. You have your women to entice the men of Israel and cause them to be unfaithful and then God will have to destroy them. That's what Balak did. That's what happened. And 24,000 of the Israelites lost their lives as a result of it. Folks, do you see how dangerous this is, what we're talking about here? I mean, these false prophets, these false teachers, we're talking about life and death. These, these, these counterfeits, and that's the character of a counterfeit. I want to tell you, he's prideful in his presumption. He's proudly presumptuous. We see his beastly behavior. And we see his godless greed. And Peter says we're living in dangerous days of damnable doctrines. And he says you've got to give diligence to make your calling and election sure. So I want to ask you, do you know this morning that you know that you know you're sure this morning that you're the real thing? That you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. All of your trust is in Him. And by the grace of God, you're trying to walk with Him and serve Him and honor Him with your life. There's nothing greater than the joy of knowing Jesus Christ and walking in His will. I heard the story of a young soldier out on the battlefield and he was struck by a mortar shell. And mangled by it. The chaplain was nearby and rushed to his side. Held him in his arms. Looked into his eyes. And the young man said, Sir, am I going to live? The chaplain could see that he wasn't. That the life was quickly leaving his body. He said, Son, listen, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? And he smiled and he said, I sure do. He said, the greatest, most wonderful day of my life is when in my home church, I walked down that aisle, gave my hand to my pastor and my heart to Jesus Christ. And I got born again. I got saved. I know I'm saved. He said, now, sir, am I going to live? And the chaplain thought about it and he said, you sure are. Because Jesus said, He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Yes, sir, you're going to live. You're going to live. Do you know that? Do you have that kind of blessed assurance? There's nothing like having that, is it? I mean having that blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. See, the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know him? Are you real this morning? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word, how it is a joy.
to gather around it. Lord, it convicts us. I'm so thankful it convinces us. I'm so thankful it changes us and conforms us to what is right and to the likeness of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray you'd search out our hearts this morning. I pray if there's one here who does not have the unspeakable joy of having blessed assurance that get it settled this morning, be able to say, Jesus is mine. Father, I pray for each Christian. Some of us are not where we ought to be. And you know that. You see the heart. Some of us are not real when it comes to walking with you, living for you, as we ought to. And I pray you'd speak to our hearts this morning. I pray we'd be tender and humble, receptive and responsive to your working in our hearts. And I pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 454. 454. Wonderful hymn that says, I'd rather have Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing.